Good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Welcome to the PTI Nice Daily Show. I am your host this morning, Mitch Babcock. I am a lead faculty on the fitness athlete division across our two online courses and a live weekend intensive. And it's good to be grabbing the mic and chatting with you guys this morning uh, after a couple week hiatus and passing the mic around to the rest of our fitness athlete division. So always great to be back. Um, I'm coordinating today. So if you watch on Facebook Live, give me bonus points for that. That never happens. I don't know how that happened. You usually get dressed in the dark and, and mismatch everything. But uh, it's good in Michigan. The weather is getting warm now. Our doors are open. The spirits are up. Uh, fitness level is kicking into high gear at our gym here at CrossFit Benton. We just ran a 5K yesterday. So a bunch of people PR in their long, slow aerobic work and uh, kicking it in for for 3.1 miles. So it was a good time here at our gym. Happy to be coming to you guys today. Our topic today is stable shoulders, a case study. So a couple times, the last few times I've been on, I've been sharing some more uh, practical, uh, what are we doing, what are we doing working with CrossFitters, right? So our clinic, Health HQ, is attached to our gym, CrossFit Fenton, and a large percentage of our caseload is active, recreationally active folks, CrossFit athletes, and their friends and, and of the like, right? So we work one-on-one with majority of this population. So what I like, what I try to do when I get a chance to share the mic is to give you very practical stuff. Of, this is what we did. This is how it's been working in real time and of one, but do with it as you like. And one of the areas that we have been spending a lot of time, myself and Alan has been working with athletes shoulders. Now we know, you know, the literature, the injury incidents uh, associated with CrossFit is low. We look at that four year analysis study that just came out this year that looked at the injury incidence rate like as low as 0.27 per 1,000 contact hours. So we know that the overall injury incidence rate is low, but we do also know that the areas most commonly to be injured, when in fact they are, uh, the shoulder, the back, and the knee, right? So we spend a lot of time uh, trying to be preventative of that, like it'd be, be, it'd be one step ahead uh, of when those shoulder injuries might show up to build really strong, stable, robust shoulders, right? We've talked a couple times about uh, building the spine, making the spine as robust as we can, like brutally strong spine. Uh, i give you a little case study about that with our friend Tim uh, talking about getting back to the deadlift. This time we're going to talk a little bit about the shoulder getting back to pressing and specifically like the thruster and the pull-up. Uh, so a little case example of an athlete we work with here, um, she was dealing with um, – more so instability, hypermobility than pain. Uh, occasionally bouts of pain with the shoulder, but more so than anything was was uh, stability requirements, right? That weakness, uh, unstable type feeling in the shoulder, and ran into it. Uh, ran into a little incident. She had a history of some um, subluxations in the past, uh, and had a little like minor subluxation uh, with a heavy thruster. Um, and she was like, you know, I just don't want this to happen. I don't want to be plagued by this. I want to get my shoulders as absolutely strong as I can. And I was like, let's do it, right? So uh, together, Alan and I devised a, a little plan for plan of attack. And what I'm going to share this morning is just basically how we broke that down, how we program that, programmed that out for that athlete, um, and what she's been doing since. Because today was kind of a big milestone in terms of getting back to the thrusters and pull-ups, the two movements that were most, most bothersome to her, right? So the pull-up more so than anything was a lot of weakness with that end range lat uh, strength, right? To try to initiate shoulder stability uh, in that position and begin the strict pull-up. And with the thruster was just when the bar would get away from her, her shoulder wasn't very strong uh, with that moment arm starting to increase as the bar drifted away from her. So some of that was technical work, technical efficiency of trying to get the bar in a better position, but a lot of that amounted to getting the shoulder strong overhead, getting really strong and stable uh, with an overhead uh, implement, kettlebells, dumbbells, and barbells, and then doing a lot of work to try to build strict strength in that. So what I'm going to do, if you're tuning in on Facebook Live, I'm going to try to share my screen. I can get some things squared up here before I do. And if you're on Instagram, you're going to have to go to Facebook. You're going to have to go to Facebook and watch the playback because what we're doing on Facebook right now is sharing a little program, right? So this is how we broke down a little uh, accessory training program for this athlete. Well, keeping in mind the two issues that we were dealing with was pushing and pulling, and that's exactly how we broke it up. So this is, you know, what goes through my head is what, how much time does a CrossFitter, this, this fitness athlete, how much time do they actually have to dedicate to accessory programming, to like come in and work on their weaknesses. So that's part of the conversation in that initial eval is like, hey, could, could you give me 20 minutes twice a day? 
or excuse me, 20 minutes twice a week. Could you come in and do 20 minutes of focused shoulder work twice a week in the gym? Maybe that's before your scheduled session, your, your scheduled training session. Maybe that's after, maybe that's on a rest day. Maybe that's during an open gym time. Like, can I get two days a week where we spend 20 to 25 minutes knocking out some, some dialed in shoulder work? And that's really the, the basis for building out the whole program. If that athlete tells me they can't do that, but they can give me one day a week, then this whole program changes, right? Because the program means absolutely nothing if they can't adhere to it. So they have to be able to stick to what we're prescribing them if we're going to see any long-term change. This athlete said, yep, I can do two days a week, um, no problem. So the way that we that we went about it was programming a push day, like a press day, and then a pull day where we could focus on like set, like, hey, let's get the shoulder strong in this pressing pattern. And then the pull day was let's get the shoulder stronger in the pulling pattern. And then each week when, when programming was kind of released, we were able to kind of choose or the athlete herself was able to choose when she wanted to kind of work on the pressing movements and not, you know, smash the press right before a heavy, you know, strict shoulder day, um, but was was rather able to program that uh, amidst her CrossFit workouts a little bit better, right? So here we go, breaking it down between the press and the pull of what we programmed for this athlete. Uh -uh. It's cut out. There it goes. Starting on day one, right? So if you look, we've broke this down over the course of four weeks. If you can see pressing week one, week two, week three, and week four on the left-hand side of your screen, and then pulling week one, week two, week three, or four on the right-hand side of your screen. If we look at just the pressing progression, right? We start with a lot of isometric stuff. We start with a lot of isometric stuff. We start going to some negatives, and then we work into some concentric stuff in the later weeks. And similarly with the pull-up, we go with some more focused lat activation, horizontal pulling drills, and then we progress into some negatives on the pull-up bar, and then eventually into some weighted pull-ups, right? And keeping with the strict, we start with some bottoms-up presses. We really like the bottoms-up with the kettlebell. One, because we can challenge the rotator cuff from a stability standpoint, keep the weights relatively lighter, but still train that pressing pattern and fire up the rotator cuff to help with the overall stability demands of the shoulder. We need that a ton. We know that, that the primary role of the rotator cuff is to keep the humeral head centrated in the, in, in the glenoid, right? We need the strong rotator cuff to be able to help us out with that. So that half kneeling bottoms up press is kind of one that we throw in there for help, right? Handstand holds. Let's get upside down. Let's get inverted and lock out that shoulder and work on some isometric hold positions overhead. This athlete is good with the handstand position, right? So this isn't like we're throwing a new movement at them at week one. They're comfortable there, but we're prescribing that because it's 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 full body weight weight bearing on the on the shoulders and a, and a lot heavier than what we would be able to get a strict press up and overhead and be able to hold an isometric position there. So we dose that out pretty pretty heavily. Five 45 second holds. If you've done a 45 second handstand hold, that's a long time. Um, you may want to work with your athletes and start that at a 15 to 20 second isometric hold and then progress them on to 30 and maybe eventually do a 45 second hold, right? So just know that that dosage is on the high side um, of what an isometric would, would, would normally fit you for. And then resting as needed in between those. And then bamboo bar. You're going to see bamboo bar a few times here in our programming. We have one. We have the luxury of having one. Understand that they're about two to three hundred dollars depending on where you get them from so um, it, you know it is an expensive piece of equipment but for what we do and the athletes we work with it is vital right so the bamboo is, is a the light bar itself uh, has some flex and some give to it but is able to withstand a lot of external loading so we can use bands and hook it up on the bamboo bar and attach kettlebells and plates etc uh, to make it a really challenging unstable implement to press up and overhead and to isometrically hold overhead so you've probably seen us if you follow along our Instagram you see us do a lot of bamboo bar pressing, seated pressing, single arm pressing, overhead carries, etc. We like to work that in for that reason, to add that unstable element, um, the, the reflexive stability nature of the shoulder while the bar is overhead. We get a lot of bang for our buck with the bamboo bar loaded with bands and then loaded down with kettlebells on top of that. So you see that we start with some overhead carries in that position, 75 feet at a weight that the athlete can manage and get overhead and control. Um, and then we progress, right? We, we make that a little harder in week two by, by bumping it up to a single arm overhead carry, right? So rather than in our press grip overhead, let's just now go to one arm, lock in that bamboo bar close to the ear and see if that athlete can control and carry that bar in that position, right? 
Um, also in week two, we take that handstand isometric hold into a negative, right? Kick up on the wall, slowly lower your head down to the mat, and then kick back off the wall. Kick up, lower yourself down, and then come back down, right? So working in that eccentric loading component and the shoulder, which is still that pressing pattern. Week three, you can see we start to get into some more pressing, right? Kettlebell overhead squats, nasty. She's able to pull these off because she's that hyper mobile athlete, which also means that she has an immaculate overhead squat. She can bring her hands together, hold them overhead, and complete a very perfect upright torso overhead squat, which allows us to load that pattern, right? For her, the tighter she gets her arm, the more stable she feels. The wider she gets her arm, the, the more unstable she feels. So we're able to load this pattern up for her, double kettlebell overhead squat, and get the shoulder strong in that position pretty early on. And we also keep in mind that the further she moves the shoulder out, the less stable or the, the weaker she's going to feel out there. So we need to start working in positions where she has to hold, not only in this position, but start to work the arm out and out uh, to be strong and be stable in that position as well. I tell that to a lot of folks at our live course. When we talk about over overhead squat grip on the bar, the arm position on the bar, our default is to always tell people a wide grip, right? Well, there's an inherent trade-off there, right? Because we're picking up more mobility, it's easier for us to keep the bar overhead with a wider grip on the bar, but inherently there's less just joint uh, stability when the arm is out that far. There's more stability of the shoulder when the arm's in tight, but it's harder from a mobility standpoint. So there's a trade-off there. Athletes who have a lot of mobility typically feel stronger, more stable with a narrow grip. And just know that going into it that we're gonna have to work the strength moving their hands outward a little bit more. Week three, we talk about bamboo strict press. This is a really tough movement. You can mimic this, guys. If you don't need to buy a bamboo bar and you have a barbell in your clinic, wrap some bands around the bar and you can press and get a similar feel. Um, you can also try to use a PVC pipe and load it down and get a similar feel. But know that if your PVC pipe breaks because you loaded it with too much extra load, that you didn't get that idea from me. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Uh, bamboo strict press and bamboo bench press, both of which are very, very challenging. You'll notice that we keep the weights really relatively light on those. 26-pound uh, kettlebells and 13-pound uh, kettlebells for the press. Uh, the, in, the inherent instability of that press pattern is going to make that really, really challenging. We don't need a ton of load on board at first uh, to be able to get what we want out of that. And then finishing out there, the, that fourth week of the press pattern before we talk about our pull, handstand negative to a deficit. Let's train a, a, a more complete range of motion, bringing our head past neutral, so not just stopping here but then bringing the hands up on plates so that we stop in a negative position. We train the full range of motion of the shoulder in the handstand uh, position. Bamboo overhead squats, single arm overhead, uh, single arm planks. Uh, I'm happy to report that from a pressing standpoint, this athlete was able to press a heavy thruster, 85 pounds, uh, for a total of 49 reps in today's workout um, with no issue, no pain, no instability, right? So all the pressing work she's been doing over the course of the last four to six weeks um, has really been paying off for her to feel a lot stronger and more stable with the bar overhead, right? Okay, moving on to our pull piece of this puzzle. Uh, similar progression, we started with some more isolation type movements to focus on the lats and to focus on stability of the scap, right? We wanna focus on like drilling the scap down when we activate the lats. When she went to pull, she had like some some strange scapular motion going on. Um, we don't label that, we don't, we don't call that anything. Um, we just simply know it's there and we want to get the shoulder as strong as we can. So part of that is locking the shoulder blades down and then activating the lats with some, with some kneeling pull downs. I think we changed those to like a seated, a banded lat pull down. We'd like to use a PVC pipe inside of two bands, like two light thin band or red bands, uh, to get that, get that full contraction with a straight arm of pulling the PVC down to the hips, right? That's how we would execute the banded lat pull down. A seal row. If you guys aren't familiar with seal rows, that's going to be like, uh, laying prone on a bench, chest supported, and then the bar is underneath the bench. So what you have to do then is elevate the bench, put the bench up on like a 12-inch box or something, right, so that the bench is up higher off the ground, so that the athlete can hang their arms down, grab onto the barbell, and do like an inverted barbell row into their chest. It's fantastic for isolating the posterior shoulder and the lats really, really good, so that's why we like that early. The other thing I'll notice, guys, that if you're looking on, on Facebook right now, you will see over in our notes here that we say reps like one to two RIR. What is RIR? Reps in reserve. 
Uh, we talk about this in our live course as well as, as trying to correlate reps and reserve uh, with like an estimated RPE, right? So trying to uh, trying to program an RPE, a rate of perceived exertion that's heavy enough to to force a uh, force adaptation. Um, but not taking the athlete to failure. So what we say is like, hey, five sets of eight, and after each set, you should feel like you maybe only have one to two reps left in the tank, right? So your reps in reserve is kind of your way of noting that. Um, okay, chin, a chin over bar holds. Isometrics at the top range of motion. Where are athletes the weakest? Um, it's at the bottom of the pull-up and at the top of the pull-up, right? How many of us get to the top of the bar and struggle with that last little bit of lat activation to actually get the chin over the bar? So instead start doing this Pez dispenser thing of like trying to get the head and the chin up and over the bar. So we'll program some chin over bar isometric holds 10 by 10 seconds. You can easily make this a Tabata or a reverse Tabata, right? Like a, a reverse Tabata would be 10 seconds on, 20 seconds rest for eight rounds. An actual Tabata would be 20 second holds, 10 second rest for eight rounds, both of which are really, really fun to program and really, really hard to execute. Uh, so if you want to be really mean with your athletes, program them a little Tabata of chin over bar holds, get a box, step yourself up there, step off the box and hold in that position. Again, with the isometric kind of hold positions first and, and progressing ourselves as we go through week two, we start to throw in a lot of our prone swimmers, I's, T's, and Y's with change plates. And then we carried those all the way through. So that was kind of like a warm-up for her. So if you're seeing the prone swimmers and the pros, Y's, T's, and I's in week two, those carried all the way throughout because they were a good primer and always to, get, to remember to hit the posterior rotator cuff uh, really heavily and keep load through that on board. Penlay rows, that's a bent over row position from the floor, similar to that seal row, but now we can get a little bit heavier because we're not just isolating the lats. Um, make it a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more full body. Week three, we start to get into some more lat sweeps with barbells, weighted chin-ups, um, where the athlete was doing four sets of six. Um, uh, we started with band assist on these, right, and progressed into a weighted chin-up option, right? So this this was a slow progression for this athlete. took more than the, the two weeks that you see here uh, to work on the weighted chin-ups, but working from a light band assist on the, on the strict pull-ups, eventually getting uh, body weight, and then eventually starting to put some external load on board, and then finishing with pull-up negatives, right? So really going heavily, uh, going heavy on the, on the external load, stepping up chin over bar, and slowly lowering herself down. Step up, chin over bar, slowly lowering herself down, right? So it was eccentrics to try to get a little bit more external load on board on top of that um, and keeping with some more lat activation drills like the single arm ring row um, and then the top half strict toe to bar to really emphasize the lat engagement and pushing down on the bar uh, for the toes to bar. Okay, the punchline, the athlete got stronger in her strict pull-ups felt more stable, be able to complete more reps, and feels a lot stronger in the thruster progression or the, the thruster movement and not as timid. Today was a really, really good test for her coming in. She's like, I'm like really scared of this pattern. And at the end of the workout was like feeling super confident for the work that she put in. Things I want you to take note of. Identifying the movement patterns that athletes need to be trained on, right? Do not forget specificity is most important. So all the accessory work in the world is great, but if it doesn't transfer over to the movement patterns that they need to get better at, then they're not going to get better at them. So identify in that early session of what movements that athlete needs to work on. The pull-up and the pressing pattern, those were our two. Understanding how much time does the athlete have and what can they be successful with as far as implementing an accessory program. So if they can only implement one day a week, you've got to be creative with what you're going to implement one day a week. If they can give you two or three days a week, then you can start to really pull some more things out of the toolbox and start to implement a few more things, more time under tension, more eccentrics of that nature, right? For this athlete, twice a, twice a week over the course of four weeks, um, utilizing reps and reserve if need be to try to help uh, correlate and, and to try to dial in the extra load that we're programming on board. At the end of the day, over the course of four to six weeks, we made some really significant improvement. Uh, and this is just one way. Again, there's, you could, you could pick this program apart and say, why'd you pick this and why didn't you pick that? And we could do that for hours. The important thing is, is that you have a, a specific progression of working that athlete from like a, from a baseline strength into some more external load so we can have some progression over time. Um, and that we have specificity 
authenticity on board with the movement patterns that we're selecting, right? So that's a little case study of an athlete we're working with. Um, I have another shoulder program to uh, crank out today that's going to look very similar uh, to this, but for a different athlete who has different movements of their own to work on. Um, it's kind of like our maintenance program, right? So you, you see us for a handful of sessions. Pain is gone. Function is improved. Um, but we can't stop there, right? So it's easier to, for us to design a program like this and say, what can you consistently do to your two days a week and go ahead and go crazy with it, right? So um, I've got another program like this to finish up today and send out to an athlete and keep their shoulders strong and heavy, right? All right. So that concludes our shoulder program. In our case study for today, I've been happy to take questions, so leave them on the Facebook page if you would, please, and I'll circle back around today uh, throughout the afternoon and take a look at your questions and try to answer them the best we can. Um, as far as courses go on, from a fitness athlete standpoint, we've got three the month of June. So Zach is going to be in Seattle with Sarah Heron um, out in uh, – I think Sarah's gym out there. Uh, it's going to be a good time. And that's the first weekend of June, I think the second and third. And then Zach's also going to be in Atlanta like the next weekend, I think like the 8th and 9th or 9th and 10th. Um, so two weekends in the, the early part of June to catch Zach. I will be out in Milwaukee uh, with my friend Guillermo and Kelly. Uh, we're going to have a good time out in Milwaukee. So you can catch us out there the 22nd and 23rd uh, if you're in the Milwaukee area. Uh, this weekend, Jeff's flying in today into the great state of Michigan, uh, and he's teaching a cervical course uh, in Ann Arbor. And I could be speaking out of line here, but there might still be a time to grab a seat for that. So if you don't have weekend plans and you think learning how to how to really comprehensively treat the neck sounds like a great time to hang with Jeff, uh, there might be a chance for you to catch a seat. And I'm not really sure, but we're going to be meeting him up for a, for a little dinner this weekend. So be able to catch Jeff and catch up. That'll be a great time. Otherwise, you guys enjoy your weekend ahead. I hope it's a great one. Uh, if you're interested in the CrossFit scene, the Rogue Invitational is going on in Columbus. Um, if you're there, give us a shout out and uh, let us know how that's going on. Uh, otherwise, we will catch you back on the air for another Fitness Athlete Friday next week. You guys take care, have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PT on Ice Daily Show. If you enjoyed this content, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're interested in getting plugged into more ICE content on a weekly basis while earning CEUs from home, check out our virtual ICE online mentorship program at ptonice.com. While you're there, sign up for our Hump Day Hustling newsletter for a free email every Wednesday morning with our top five research articles and social media posts that we think are worth reading. Head over to ptonice.com and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up.